Hello, everybody. Hello. As you are joining, uh, we will give it a moment for people to join today's Legislative Advocacy 201 training. Welcome. Welcome. We are going to start right at 1201. So welcome, everybody. And as you are coming in, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat, who you are, where you're coming from today, uh, what you maybe want to learn in today's training. Uh, and now it is 12.01. We will keep letting people in, uh, but I will turn it over to our friends at Team Jami first uh, to give us uh, an introduction video on how to use the simultaneous interpretation feature uh, today. Uh, friends of Jami, please take it away. And can everybody hear me okay? Okay. We can hear you, but I'm not hearing the interpreter. Here we go. Este es un espacio multilingüe. This is a multilingual space. Please speak slowly for interpreters. Por favor, hablen despacio para les interpretes. Si está conectada a través de su computadora y quiere escuchar la interpretación del inglés al español, favor de hacer clic en el globo que aparece a mano derecha. Luego haz clic en español para escuchar la interpretación. Si está llamando desde su celular, haz clic en more o más, luego interpretation o interpretación, luego español y finalizado. To hear interpretation from Spanish into English, please click on the globe on the bottom right. Then click on English to hear the interpretation. If you're calling from a cell phone, click on more, then language interpretation, then English and done. Thank you friends. And thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Gino Nuzalillo. I use he, him pronouns. I am the campaigns manager at Common Cause North Carolina. We appreciate everyone joining us at noon on a Thursday and what is a long week uh, to dive deeper with us into the legislature in North Carolina, how we can advocate with lawmakers uh, and everything that we need to know uh, about being a lobbyist and being an advocate. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes for you uh, as we come back up onto uh, this training. First, you will receive today all the materials, all the recording, all the trainings, uh, all the good stuff, including a toolkit and a guide uh, that will be made for you after this training. So don't worry about taking furious notes. Don't worry about trying to get everything on the screen. You will receive all the materials in your email inboxes after this training. Second, today, as part of our 201 training, if you joined us from the 101 training in the previous weeks, we will have an extensive time today for breakout rooms in which you will be grouped by the region you are coming from uh, to talk, to get to know people who are in your region, to answer questions and more. So we'll start the first part of today's training with some additional content we want you to know. And then in the second half of the training, we'll spend a good bit of time in breakout rooms, which means also uh, that uh, we will be going just a little bit over time today to about 1.15, but if you need to leave at 1, you are good to go. Please don't feel like you have to stay the whole time. But just to give time for those breakout rooms, it'll be a little bit longer. Now, we are here today for one purpose, which is to get you ready to advocate with us at the North Carolina General Assembly and in your home districts. Uh, as we talked about before, state lawmakers are busy this year, including and in introducing bills on everything from taxes to the environment to Medicaid expansion and voting. Corporations and interest groups, of course, have their own lobbyists on Jones Street. But what this state needs is you. Again, it is you, a people's lobby that's ready to show up, turn up and turn out to make sure your lawmakers are accountable to you. So we're here today with our friends uh, from the various organizations who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves 
uh, briefly. And a note to all of our speakers uh, that we do have simultaneous Spanish interpretation today. So please make sure to speak slowly when you come on. Uh, but just to introduce who's talking to you today, I want to first turn it over to Sailor Jones. Thank you, Gino Nuzalillo. My name is Sailor Jones. I use he, him pronouns. I'm Associate Director at Common Cause North Carolina and grateful to be with all of you. Also grateful to be here with the great Carol Moreno. Carol? Thanks, Sailor. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol with Democracy NC. I'm the Policy and Programs Manager. I'm really excited to see some familiar faces on here and to hear all the questions people have. Um, and I'm going to throw it over to Javita. Hey, good afternoon, Javita Lee with North Carolina Black Alliance. I'm the program director for the Black Alliance, and I will pass it back to you, Gino, for the next speaker. Thank you, Javita. And I want to introduce now Ann Webb. Ann, come on through. Hi, folks. My name is Ann Webb. Um, this is my first day as policy director at Common Cause NC. Very excited to be with all of you today and look forward to working with you. I use she, her pronouns. And I'll pass it over um, back to you, Gino, because I'm not sure who needs to introduce themselves. All good. Just a few more folks. Uh, Dom Blagrove, I think you are joining us today, my friend. You want to introduce yourself briefly to the good folks? Hey, y'all. Uh, Dawn Blagrove. I am the executive director of Emancipate NC, and I am happy to be here with y'all and hope we, we can answer some questions so that we can use the power of the people. Thank you, Don. And last person we'll introduce for now, uh, Marquez Thompson. Come on through, my friend. All right. Sorry, I had a bit of a technical thing. Um, so nice to meet you. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Marquez Thompson. Pronouns are he, him. I'm the organizing director for Democracy NC. Thank you, Marquez. And you will meet all of these people and more who are helping us today in your breakout rooms. So never fear. And as you are coming on, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from uh, and anything you want to learn today. Now, a few group norms and an outline before we get started. So we already asked you to introduce yourselves because we are here to educate, but we also want to know about you. We are also nonpartisan organizations. This is a nonpartisan space and a place for nonpartisan solutions to the challenges we face. We know that the issues that we're facing in North Carolina are moral issues and that we side with no one but the people. And that is why we are here today. We are also centering racial justice and an intersectional movement in North Carolina. We know that racist and oppressive policies cause many of the representation and resource inequities in this state over the past few decades and in our history. And it is only this acknowledgement and a fusion movement that will help us map a future we can believe in. And now finally, we know that this has been a long fight, that a lot of people here who are joining us today are exhausted from all the work they're doing. I know I am, I know Jovita, Jovita Lee is, I know everyone here is, uh, but the purpose of us being here today is to build our collective power uh, and to say that we need each other more than ever uh, if we are going to push back against the harmful policies coming out of Raleigh and the General Assembly. Now, one more time, you will receive all the materials from this training. We're also going to go through a lot of content here in the first part of the training. So if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or feel free to save them for the breakout rooms where you'll have a lot of time to talk amongst each other. So with that, uh, sit back, relax, have a beverage of your choice. Uh, and we are going to start first with Carol and Javita doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the legislature, including how the hell to figure out where the bills are. So Carol, uh, will you take us away? Sure, well, thanks so much, Gino. Um, so for folks that were with us in our 101 training, you'll remember that we briefly touched on how a bill becomes a law and what to expect when you show up to the General Assembly. So now, as you know, just mentioned, we're going to go a little deeper, but if you do need a refresher, we're going to drop a link in the chat in just a moment that walks you through the bill passage process. You just want to take a look at that and follow along. But before going into tracking bills, one thing I do want to mention in terms of a timeline is a term called the crossover deadline, which for folks that are tracking bills, 
um, will be something that you might find to be really helpful. And what this means is that that deadline, which this year is May 4th, um, will tell you when a bill must cross both cha chambers, so that's the Senate and the House, um, in order to move forward. And there are some exceptions to this rule. And so some of those exceptions are bills involving appropriations. So that's the budget, um, gubernatorial nominations and appointments, um, bills dealing with amendments to our state constitution, bills dealing with redistricting and bills dealing with elections. So what that means for our work right now um, is that we might be fighting some of these bills if you're working on bills in the election space for a bit longer this session. So with that, we'll start off with um, how to find and track bills. And I know we had a lot of questions um, about this in the last session. Um, so just to start off, we'll drop a link to how to navigate to the NCGA website in our chat. Um, and please don't feel like you need to take any notes. As Gina already mentioned, we're going to send out some resources afterwards, um, but we encourage you to experiment on the website as we're going along. Um, and you can feel free to take your time because a lot of information to learn at once. Um, so when you visit the NCGA website, you can see what's might be off mute. You can mute that. Um, but just to reiterate, when you um, are on the NCGA website, you can see what stances your legislators take on bills, what committees they're on, and when they've introduced a bill. You can also look up any bills by searching the bill text, and you'll see that arrow in the top right corner where you can navigate to that, um, searching it by using the bill number, um, or you can also search by committee. You can use this search function, um, and the search also allows you to specify or narrow what you're looking for, um, such as the see all button with the drop down arrow, um, which will allow you to kind of filter it a little bit more closely. On the bottom right hand side of the NCGA website, you can see what is the legislative calendar, which shows different meetings happening in the NCGA. And when you go through and you click those links, you can also find a live stream of the committee meetings, um, the committee pages, and more, such as the bill pages. Um, another note is that when you click on the committee pages, such as the rules and operations of the Senate, which is a very important committee, most bills will go through this, um, you're taken to a page where you can see the lawmakers who are a part of the committee. You can also see bills considered by that committee, and you su can subscribe to meeting notes by email. Um, and you can also click on a particular legislator, um, for example, um, Senator Bill Raybon to see their contact information um, and who, yeah, and who they've introduced the bill. You can see his district and more information about the legislator. Um, to kind of go over when you, what a bill page looks like, once you've navigated that to that piece of it, um, as, as an example, Senate Bill 226, the Freedom to Vote Act, you will see on the top left corner the different editions of the bill. At times, there may also be a bill summary that condenses the bill into plain words. I know that I have found that to be really helpful. Um, and you can also see other things at the bottom um, of that page, such as when there's an amendment, um, which means a change has been made to the language um, since its original introduction. On the bill page, you'll also be able to identify what committee the bill has been assigned to and if it has been re-referred to a different committee. And at times you may see something at the bottom of that page, kind of in that right column um, that's on the screen that is labeled as a PCS, which means a proposed committee substitute, um, which is just another term of saying um, when a committee introduces different language in lieu of another bill that was originally referred to the committee. So um, as we kind of shared in the last training, if the bill has been vetoed, you'll also see that it has been sent to the governor's desk um, on the bill page. And if the governor has issued a veto, there will be a link with a letter that accompanies his explanation of why he made that choice. 
And as a reminder, the governor has 10 days after he has received a bill to sign or veto it. And if he hasn't done either, the bill does become a law, does become law. One final note, as you can see on the slide, you can also sign up for email alerts from all the committees, including the House and the Senate. Um, and um, you can also see the different committees at by going to ncleg.gov slash committees um, by scrolling to the bottom of the page. Now, many of you asked in our last legislative training as well, um, how can I track legislation? Um, so that is how you can do it on your own. But if you want to look at tools um, that might make this process a little easier, especially because sometimes you're tracking multiple bills at once and you might have a hard time keeping up. Um, we do have a resource that we're encouraging folks to use, and that is called Upstate NC. Um, so Upstate NC allows you to create your own free profile and you can click a track bills when you navigate to the website um, and it'll keep all the bills you're tracking in one page for you and you can even sign up to get updates when that bill is going to be heard or, or text alerts um, when that bill is going to be heard. So as I said, that was a lot of info, but we'll definitely send over resources of um, that process. I'm sure we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, and now that we've talked a bit about how to navigate the website um, and keep tabs on bills, I'm going to pass it over to Javita to talk more about how to advocate with your lawmakers. Thanks, Carol. And so as a reminder that Carol just lifted, um, you will be getting all of this information um, afterwards, but also we want to make sure that you're saving your questions for the breakout rooms that we're going to have later, or you can utilize the Q&A function um, at the bottom right of your screen. And so going into power mapping your legislators, so when identifying your influential targets and in supporting or opposing a piece of legislation, there's some questions you'll want to think about and consider around who's the primary sponsor of the bill, what's their background, their occupation, whether current or retired, special interests, um, who may be contributing to their campaigns, um, if they're on a committee, who's the chair of the committee, um, who will I have to go through, who are the groups that may be supporting or opposing the same issues, is there anyone you can collaborate with, or are there folks that you know you may want to just be mindful of that may be against the common interest. Um, and so when thinking about uh, bill sponsors specifically, when a legislator introduces a bill, they may identify themselves as a primary bill sponsor. If a legislator is a primary bill sponsor, that means they are prioritizing moving that bill forward and they may work closely with other members to ensure that they can gather more votes in support of the bill. Secondary sponsors may endorse a bill, but they're less influential targets. Knowing which committees your bill may be assigned to can give you an idea of the committee chairs that may have influence over whether your bill is heard or stalled. So once you've identified your targets, you'll want to think about who you can rely on to be your champion legislators. So champions are folks that you can get to agree with you on um, your issue, working with you on your issue, uh, based on the relationships that you've developed with them. And so that moves us into one of the critical pieces of all of this work is relationship building. Relationship building is a very key thing when you are engaged in this line of work in any capacity. Who you develop relationships with in the process of advocacy is key. So you may be working on multiple issues and your champion legislator has relationships with members of other committees that can connect you um, with other folks that you know, you'll know you be able to lean on, uh, folks that you can make connections with, um, develop connections with, uh, utilize the relationships of others. So their relationships can become your relationships. Um, and the more that you can kind of build that power amongst the relationships that you build and then the relationships that those folks have, um, you'll be able to uh, create influence as well. And so that's super impactful. And so there's a couple tips around um, you know, how you can make an impact when you're talking to your legislator. And so when you're talking to lawmakers, your approach should be different than if you're talking to advocates that you are calling on to take action on an issue. So a couple of things, when giving testimony in committee, so when you're giving that uh, testimony or that public comment, 
be brief, whether you're providing a you know, committee testimony, if you're meeting with your legislator, you have to be mindful of the time given. And so you wanna get right to your point. Um, if you're speaking in committee, you wanna be early. You wanna make sure that you're actually added to the speaker's, li speaker's list, excuse me, if one is offered. Um, but you'll also want to make sure that your testimony stays within that two minute limit. You can kind of go ahead and assume that you'll have two minutes to speak. Um, establish yourself and your community. The most effective testimony is established when you are actually speaking from the perspective of your community, the community that you are representing that day. So if you're a constituent of the legislator or reside in their county, make sure that you mention it, okay? Because that's super important so they know that. Um, provide evidence and a, list, and a list of consequences. So it's really good to include stats and facts. So if you're able to do some quick research on your issue area that you are coming to advocate for, or to make public comment about, um, it's really good to have that additional evidence to support your point. Um, so, you know, doing that additional uh, research, how that bill um, may impact you, may impact your community, how it's been seen in other states. What you'll notice is a lot of legislation is copies of other states' legislation. Sometimes it's copies of our own legislation that we've seen before. And so really being mindful of those points and seeing, okay, in Florida or in Texas or any other state that's comparable to North Carolina, how does this stuff compare? And what can you, you know, involve in your public comment? Make sure you choose the compelling that uh, data points um, in your comments. So make sure you know the kind of hard hitting stats. That's what folks want to hear. And so make sure that you put that at the top. Um, specify and ask. What are you asking for? Um, end with exactly what you want the lawmaker to do. So we can ask more from legislators than simply support or oppose. You can ask your lawmaker to speak to members of their caucus, find alignment on the issue. Uh, you can introduce an amendment to change the language of the bill. Um, you can ask for them to meet with other members of your community. Um, you can ask you know, to speak to a committee chair or have them speak to a committee chair or share intelligence and so many more options that you'll have. And so we're gonna look into what this kind of looks like in real time, in real life. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Gino who is gonna transition us to the next part so we can kind of see this in practice. Thank you, Jovita. Uh, now that is a lot of information. And we've talked about some deadlines around bills. Uh, we've talked about how to navigate the website. We've talked about some tips on how to advocate. And now we're going to hear uh, from some experts in this field who have been leading and participating in campaigns, both inside the legislature in Raleigh and at the grassroots all across North Carolina. And so here in a moment, just to talk for a few moments to offer some case studies that can ground us in what this looks like. Uh, we're going to invite in Sayla Jones, uh, Marquez Thompson, uh, Don Blagrove, and Jovita Lee. And the first question for this little portion that's kind of quasi panel, uh, I, I want to ask Sayla uh, to run us through, there was a campaign uh, in 2018, if I remember right, uh, that was about restoring the last Saturday of early voting. Uh, we know these lawmakers love nothing better than to make it harder to vote. And we want a campaign to prevent that from happening in this case. Sailor, could you tell us a little bit about that campaign and what made it successful and what you learned? Thank you, Gino. Yeah, for a decade, anti-voter lawmakers in Raleigh have targeted North Carolina's most popular way of casting a ballot the state's 17-day early voting period. And back in 2018, that was no different. Lawmakers passed Senate Bill 325. It was a law back then that required uniform 12-hour, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. weekday early voting hours in all 100 counties. It also eliminated voting on the most popular final Saturday before Election Day. Now, when they required those weekday hours, it forced counties to eliminate other options that were more popular in communities all across the state. As a result, that year, more than half, half of North Carolina counties were forced to cut the number of satellite sites from what they offered in 2014. And two thirds of counties reduced the number of weekend voting hours from 2014 as well. 
So in 2019, thanks to the advocacy of voters just like you, friends, lawmakers proposed House Bill 893. After we pressured them, this bill would restore the final Saturday of early voting and put the flexibility to determine early voting schedules back where it belonged in the hands of county boards of elections. And it's important to understand the tactics used to win this victory back then, because similar and more overt cuts to early voting have already been proposed this session, friends. For example, an easy to remember House Bill 123, which would rewrite the Constitution to slash our vo early voting options by 10 whole days. Now, back then, in 2018, 2019, democracy advocates used what's called an inside outside strategy to push for this important change back from uniform hours and removing Saturday voting to winning back Saturday voting and removing those uniform requirements. That was won by a combination of the types of advocates you see here today. There was research, lobbying, and public comment. Our coalition partners provided important research to you so you could go and make informed and effective public comment during the committee hearings that Javita and Carol described. There were targeted actions, texting and phone banking, pumping hundreds of thousands of voices into the General Assembly to put political pressure on those who did not support restoring the last Saturday of early voting. There were communications toolkits and social media platforms used to elevate these issues on the digital stage and really bring even more and younger voices to bear in this. And speaking of, we elevated unique voices and opportunities through events and actions. I remember back then I worked at Democracy NC and our Democracy Summer interns led a press conference and lobby day all devoted to restoring their favorite day of early voting. That was the last Saturday. So Gino, it was an incredible campaign, one that was successful and one that elevated research that showed that last Saturday of early voting, it was used by people from both sides of the political aisle, which ultimately made a big difference to Republicans and Democrats alike. Thank you, Sailor. And I want to just kind of build off that with Marquez. Marquez, you have been based out in the eastern part of the state uh, and involved in all these campaigns, in the words of, of sailors, since Jesus wept. So can you tell us uh, just a little bit more uh, from your perspective, being out east, uh, what you've learned from these campaigns, the tactics that have worked uh, to mobilize advocates, uh, and any brilliant reflections I know you have uh, to share with the fine folks here? Yeah, thank you, Gino. And I, I would just say quickly that um, one of the most important things um, was what Sailor mentioned toward the end was the impact that the young people had in the movement, the um, Democracy Summer Program, which we are taking applic <clears throat> applications for even as we speak. Um, so <laughs> in the East, you know, it's very important uh, and everywhere in North Carolina, but especially in the East, it's more of a rural area. And so one-to-one -one relationships are very important when you see the energy and the exuberance of young people uh, fighting for something, that really meant a lot to some of our um, uh, older advocates that have been doing this work for, you know, just as long as not longer than, you know, as long as Jesus wept. So when you see that new energy and you see the, the fight that the young people had when they saw that and, you know, and then having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with people out in the community and really doing everything we could do. Uh, I remember going to, um, uh, to a, a, a TV studio, a local um, studio here in, in the East and, and being on TV with the young people telling about the story. And then afterwards, all the people that were saying, I just saw y'all on TV, tell me about, you know, tell me more. And so that exuberance, that one-on-one, -on -one, taking the media and the, the, the ability to talk to a lot of people and then following that up with one-on-one -on -one conversations and the young people that really meant a lot and helped us to win that, that, um, that campaign. Thank you, Marquez. Uh, and I want to turn next to uh, Don Blagro. Don, uh, you have been both outside and inside the legislature uh, on various bills. I know HB 40 has been a big one. Uh, but when it comes to, I wonder if you could speak a little bit when it comes to actually talking with your lawmakers in Jones Street or in your districts, uh, how do you approach 
those conversations? What have you found to be effective and what uh, cautions would you offer to the group? So um, thank you for the question. I'm glad to be here. This is an important training. Um, when I talk to legislators, um, I come armed, number one, with facts, which is important, but they know the facts. And here's what I want you all to remember, right? Most of your legislators are not the sharpest tools in the toolbox, okay? So what you think might be persuasive, like facts, like statistics, like cost analysis, are not always the most effective ways to get done what you want to get done, okay? They are not the most effective ways to convey the information or to sway that person's opinion, okay? What you have to do is find out, number one, where they live. What does that mean? That means what matters to them, what is important to them, what motivates them, why are they in office? Why, do, why are they in office? What do they say publicly? Why are they really in office, right? And this is about learning people, talking to people, and understanding and picking up cues from the people that you're talking to, okay? Um, once you figure out where someone lives, then talk to them from that place. You're not gonna have a whole bunch of time. So you need to be super impactful immediately, right? Um, I, will, I can say when we were talking about Raise the Age and we were trying to get back in 2019, we finally got it done. Um, the way that we got it done was talking about white children, right? And talking to legislators about what happens when your kid, right? Putting your kid's face on the implications and the collateral consequences of Raise the Age. That's what makes the difference. Find out where people live and speak to them from that place. Now, was it difficult to do that? Did it feel like a moral compromise? Hell yeah, hell yeah. But I understand that at the end of the day, what we really want to do is make sure that this law gets changed and I know that it is going to help black children in a disproportionate way than it's gonna help white children, but I gotta put white children's faces on it to get these legislators to pay attention. You do what you gotta do, right? So I would tell you, use your gut, speak from your heart, know that they're not very smart and help help cater, you know, dumb it down as, much, as best you can, right? And also do not assume I need you to leave Mr. Smith goes to Washington at home. That's not who your legislators are. That's not, they're not that. They closer to like Barney Fife, right? So speak to them in a way that you need to, that you would talk to a kid, right? Or someone, um, someone who needs to understand a concept very quickly, but at a high level, because they don't need deep level understanding to support it. That's the other thing. All right, I'm going to stop talking there. I could keep going, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> well, Don, the folks who will be in your breakout room uh, are going to love to be there with you. And thank you, as Reverend Max said, for the real talk. I want to close out this section uh, with just a few more minutes to ask Javita. Uh, Javita, I know, especially with the pandemic, that trying to make our advocacy accessible and safe for everyone uh, is an important component of how we do this work. So can you talk a little bit about how Black Alliance uh, has used and made advocacy accessible to everyone to make sure everyone's comfortable with the work that we do? Sure. So honestly, um, I think what was assumed by a lot of lawmakers was when we went into pandemic, it was like high time for them to just pass whatever they want to do that anyway. But they really kicked it into hyperdrive when we went into pandemic because they assumed people weren't paying attention. But that was complete opposite. And so we were able to create um, things like, you know, uh, town halls that were virtual. Um, open discussions, caucus meetings, all different types of things took place during the pandemic that folks could engage in um, when it came to being responsive to these bills, but also thinking back to moratoriums. That was times where folks' lights were off. Uh, they were being, you know, 
evicted from their homes. And so it's like, how do you assist somebody um, through a laptop? through a computer when we are, you know, we have to stay at home, but then campaigns that were created by community leaders like need a home to stay at home can issue something saying to stay in a home and then you're taking people out of their homes, where are they staying? And so we were able to really capitalize on the fact of like, if you're asking folks to keep themselves safe, then you need to provide what's needed to actually stay in those homes and to keep them uh, keep those folks safe. And so we were able to do literally all types of advocacy on virtual platforms. I remember um, our defense against HB 805. Um, that was a 12 hour virtual um, town hall and broadcast. 12 hours. We swapped out folks who were leading the broadcast, but we were on from sunup to sundown about HB 805, and then it disappeared. Why? Because the power of the people. It does not just exist when you're walking into the building. It exists within us. And so no matter what platform we're using, we can still capitalize on the power of the people to get the work done. And that's what we had to do. And so I think it honestly gave us the opportunity to kick it up a notch because we didn't have the kind of the barriers of having to actually travel somewhere. We got from one thing to another, and we were hitting them hard, um, and it was effective. Thank you, Jovita, and thank you to all of our panelists. We do have to move into the next section right before we get to breakouts, but if you are on screen, give a little, give a little shimmy, give a little uh, celebration and a thank you to our panelists for sharing some of their wisdom. Uh, I want to I see those little shimmies. That's right, Eileen. Yeah, that's right. Get the hands up. Uh, thank you to our panelists. You will get to spend more time with these folks uh, in your breakout rooms. Uh, but before we get into those breakout rooms, uh, we want to go over just a couple of the additional bills of many that are running through the legislature right now, both to kind of uh, that will help us as we think about the questions we want to ask the strategizing that we want to do, um, and the continued conversation that our panelists here started. So Carol, before we go to the breakout rooms, can you just give us uh, the rundown on some of the bills happening right now in Raleigh? Well, do Gina, and one thing I want to mention first is that these really are just a few democracy-oriented bills, but we know there are a lot of other bills out there that impact different issue areas. And one of the wonderful things about all the folks that were just on this panel is that we all work across multiple issues. So we will send out contact information later on, and different folks can definitely provide resources on some other bills that are being heard in the legislature. Um, but to start off with the democracy democracy bills that we've seen this session. If you want to move forward, thank you. Um, we have seen a reintroduction of Senate Bill 89, a bill to prohibit private money in elections administration. This bill was known as Senate Bill 725 in 2021 when it was actually vetoed by Governor Cooper, and it would prohibit the state and local election administrators from receiving any kind of private funding. And the reason we're concerned about this bill is because it doesn't actually designate any replacement funding source for elections. And we've seen a lot of funding cut not, not just to our local county boards and rural areas, but also to our state board of elections. And um, as we all know, access to the ballot is important for all of the issues we work on. So for continuing to see legislators underfund elections, we're going to see um, less access to voters. Moving on to the next slide, there is also Senate Bill 88 and House Bill 304, which are both the Election Day Integrity Act. Um, this was known as Senate Bill 326 in 2021, which was also at the time vetoed by Governor Cooper, and it would limit access to voting by mail by shortening the acceptance window for absentee ballots. Um, and what I think is even more concerning outside of that, if we move forward to one more slide, um, are several bills that have been introduced to reduce early voting access. So that's House Bill 123 and House Bill 303. Um, these re bills would reduce the early voting period by a week. Um, and we know that people already have a hard time getting to the ballot as it is, especially if you are a voter that is working and is busy. So the early voting access is essential to making sure that people can make it there. 
Um, but on the upside, we have also seen some pro-democracy bills. Um, so if we move forward to that last slide, this is just one of them. Um, but we have seen House Bill 293 and Senate Bill 226, which are both the Freedom to Vote Act, um, that is actually advocating for more funds to be allocated to the State Board of Elections and also addresses um, the it addresses voter intimidation, it improves our online voter registration process, and a lot more. And just in this last week, we saw the introduction of the, of the Safeguard Elections Act and Fix Our Democracy, which hit at a lot of other issues as well. Um, one of those being protecting election workers, as we've seen harassment increase over the last years, over the last few years. Um, so um, with that, I'm actually going to throw it back to you, Gina, as we start our breakouts. Thanks, y'all. All right. I can tell by what is happening in the chat that y'all are ready to talk to each other. So that is what we are going to do now and what we will do for the rest of the time. Uh, and Brian, I may actually ask you just to, uh, as the breakout rooms come up so people can see them, I may ask you to stop sharing screen for a moment. And I'm going to give you all the instructions of how this will go. Now, if you do not see the breakout rooms pop up on your Zoom screen, do not worry. We will make sure to move you ourselves to those rooms. But in a moment, you are going to see a prompt to join one of nine breakout rooms. These breakout rooms are divided by the region that you live in. So there are three triangle groups. There is no difference between the triangle groups. Uh, each one will have a facilitator from our staff organizations in them, but there's no difference between triangle one or triangle three. So just feel free to join one that maybe doesn't have as many people or avoid ones that have too many people. But we'll have three triangle breakout rooms. We will have two triad area. So anyone who's in that Guilford, uh, Forsyth, uh, any of the counties surrounding those major metros, two triad breakout rooms. We will have one Charlotte metro area. So if you are in Mecklenburg, Cabarrus, Union, Gaston, join the Charlotte metro breakout room. We will have an Eastern North Carolina one for all of us uh, east of Raleigh and east of 995. We will have a Western North Carolina one if you are in the mountains. Uh, and then we will have a Sand Hills breakout room, which includes Cumberland, Anson, Richmond, Scotland, Hoke, uh, Moore County, those kinds of counties in the Sand Hills. So in a moment, you will see this pop up on your screen, and it should give you the option to choose the breakout room that corresponds with where you live. And when you get into those breakout rooms, you'll have a facilitator from one of our organizations. You'll take some time to introduce yourselves, some time to ask questions, have conversation with each other. Uh, and if you'd like, talk a little bit more about past experiences you've had with lawmakers and let the conversation go uh, wherever it feels most organic. So do we feel clear on those instructions, my friends? Give me two thumbs up if you do. Perfect. All right. Uh, so here it's going to come in a minute. And like I said, do not worry if it doesn't immediately show up for you. We can manually assign and we'll get to work on that. So here it comes. Three, two. One, all the rooms should be open. We'll start letting folks uh, take a second. If you are uh, not able to join, uh, just put your name in the chat and the region that you should be in, uh, and we'll get that, we'll get you assigned in a moment. Uh, but just take some time. This is Judith. Does everyone know? I had to look for a minute <clears throat> to go to the bottom of your screen and look for the icon that says breakout rooms and click on that. There are four little squares for those of you that are over 75 like me. Thank you, Judith. That's really helpful. That is that is a good thing I should have said. So thank we don't you. We all know this. And I, one thing I forgot to mention, friends, if you need uh, to, if you need the Spanish speaking interpretation, stay in this main room. If you need Spanish speaking interpretation, Stay in this main room. Uh, and uh, if you are in Gates County, uh, go to the Eastern North Carolina room, my friend. All right. 
And folks, if we've got you in the chat, and sorry, Josel, you should be co-host now. Uh, we're going to start assigning those folks. So just give us a few minutes, y'all. Sit tight. Uh, we'll get you in there. Kimberly, yes. I, Cabarrus County, feel free to join the Charlotte group. All right, we're going, going, going. 34 of us left. And Gina, you're welcome to go ahead and hop in your breakout room and I can help folks um, that are still getting acquainted if you'd like. Um, but yes, if people that are still having trouble just wanna put, okay, I see James and we'll have people continuing to assign folks as we're going along if you're having trouble being added to your breakout room. All right, Cindy. Right. Okay, Carol. I was just responding to a few questions, but I'm going to head to the rest of the breakout rooms now. And uh, please be patient with Carol. Y'all will get you uh, uh, into those rooms in just a moment. Okay. Yes, folks, we're going along. We're trying to do it as quickly as we can. Um, I'm seeing some folks are being moved. All right, and for folks that are left, if you're still working on figuring out your breakout rooms, if you just wanna put it in the chat, um, the county or region you're in, we can help you find the right room. And I see you, Robert. Welcome, welcome. All right, we have someone in Charlotte. Vicki, what county are you in? If you're still in here. Yes, Randolph, okay. I'm gonna re-invite you. All right, Carla. All right, folks, just give us a few more moments here and we'll wrap up.
All right, folks, I'm seeing most are in breakout rooms. If you still aren't, our um, lovely tech support will continue assigning folks. Um, but this breakout room is now um, going to shift for folks that might need some support with um, Spanish translation. It will be a Spanish breakout room. Um, so for everyone else that's waiting, just continue to put your county in the chat if you haven't already. Um, and we'll get you to the right breakout room in just a moment. Um, so I guess to start off, just wanted to check if anyone that is in this space is needing Spanish translation. Um, could you raise your hand? Um, entonces vamos a empezar este cuarto con um, las personas que necesitan traducción para español. Um, quiero chequear primero si hay alguien en el espacio que necesita transli um, translación en español. Um, y si, si necesitas esa ayuda, puedes uh, colocar tu mano arriba. Hay una manera de hacerlo en la página por abajo, um, donde puedes hacer una reacción um, y puedes uh, colocar una im imagen o levantar tu mano o colocar algo en el chat. And I'll just keep checking in in a moment as folks are still getting acquainted. Hi, Debbie. So I'm just reading the chat to you. You are not in the triangle one. So let us go ahead and move you. Oh, perfect. Okay. Isn't this way I check in una vez más? Si hay alguien en el espacio que necesita ayuda con um, haciendo esta sección en español. Um, y si necesitas ayuda y um, podrías colocar tu nombre en el chat, eso sería bien, um, para que podamos saber si este cuarto es necesario. Preston, is there somewhere that you'd like to go? Which county are you in? Um, I'm in um, Mecklenburg County, Charlotte. Oh, Brad, get you moved right now. Thank you. D, is there a, uh, a, a breakout room you would like to go to, D? Which county are you in? Or Miss Tanya Roberts? Which county are you in? I can move you. Durham, how is everybody? Doing good. I'll get you in that room right now. Thank you. And Ms. Lee, I hope I'm saying your name right. Do you need any support finding a room? And it's also perfectly fine if folks are just taking a little bit of a break in this space. All right, while we're waiting for folks, um, I am going to provide some support to our other breakout sessions. Would just like to confirm one more time to see if anyone would like to be in this session in Spanish. Um, voy a hacer un, um, 
Además, quiero chequear una vez más y si alguien que necesita apoyo um, haciendo esta parte en español, uh, me encanta hablar con la gente, pero y si nadie necesita la ayuda, um, voy a apoyar otros cuartos. Gracias, Carol. Yo salgo aquí también, yo puedo ayudar si tú necesito. Gracias, Giselle. All right, y'all, you're in good hands. I'm sure some folks might still need some support, and we'll see you all in just a few minutes. Thank you.
Welcome, Carla. We are in breakout rooms right now uh, by county and where you're located. What county are you calling in from today? And I can get you moved with some other folks from your same region. You're on mute, so you just hit that little unmute button. I'm switching to the phone, to the um, to the computer laptop. So okay, uh, I've been on the phone and now I'm at home and uh, I'm just going with the uh, Western North Carolina. And I've been listening. I've been listening. I just now went switch from my phone. No worries. My, yeah. So I'm in there with the Western North Carolina. Okay, I'll get you moved over there right now. Yeah. I'll be put back in that room. Alita, would you like to be moved to your region? What county are you calling in from? Welcome back, Sailor. Sorry, y'all. I'm gonna head back to the West, but Giselle, thank you, my friend. No, all good. Welcome, Susan. We are having a breakout session for folks that are in the same region. What county are you calling in from today? And I can get you moved with the, some of your community members. Welcome, Michelle. We are having breakout rooms right now. What county are you calling in from? And I can get you set up with folks from your region.
Welcome, Audrey. We are in breakout rooms tonight now having some community discussions. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm going to broadcast really quick um, to all the rooms. We're going to have them come back in about four minutes uh, so we can close out by 1.15. So let me make sure I do this right. Okay. Uh, forgive me. It allows me to like broadcast my voice, which is wild, but okay. That's new. It's so, it makes me feel so weird. Just so. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. This is Gino. Uh, we will be coming back at 1.10, at 1.10, uh, and we will be closing out the breakout rooms here in just a few minutes. See you soon. Hi, Tina. Welcome back. Uh, we will be uh, coming, everyone coming back to the main room in about three minutes, two minutes now. Welcome back, everybody. Folks have about 60 seconds to come back in. Make sure as you come in that you mute yourself uh, just in case. And we will give people about 20 more seconds to come back in. Here they come. We're coming back in. Good to see everybody. I hope you had a good time in your breakout rooms. Last Thursday night's training, people didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay on all night. Uh, maybe today you did want to leave. Maybe you don't want to think about that legislature anymore, and I would understand if you didn't. Yep, sorry, you all. Oh. <laughs> no, you're good. All right. Gina, my group needs more time again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what has a lot to say. I promise y'all you will uh we will be figuring out a good way to keep all of y'all in contact. Um while while we're closing up here, uh maybe just share in the chat really quick uh anything that stood out uh to you, questions you still have, um anything, any shout outs you want to give. I know uh Western North Carolina got to be with Sailor Triangle One, got to be with Jane. Uh, so if you have anything uh, you want to share in the chat after the breakouts, please do. Uh, we're capturing the chat, especially if you have any questions um, or any takeaways uh, that you got from it. And so to close us out, because I know it's middle of the day, we got to get back to eating. We got to get back to work. Uh, we're going to leave you all with a few next steps. Uh, so, Brian, would you be willing to share again? Thank you, sir. Oh, I just opened up Adobe. Sorry about that, y'all. 
Uh, so we cannot let you leave here without some good next steps. Uh, we hope that you had a good time getting to know folks in your neck of the woods. Like I said, we're going to be trying to figure out an easy way to keep y'all connected with each other because these trainings are great. And we are, a lot of us are based here in places like Triangle or in Charlotte, uh, but for building people power, for organizing, it's really going to be about y'all who are in those same regions together, uh, getting to work together. So we're going to try to find a good way to make sure you get to stay in contact with those people. And also uh, feel free to share your contact information with anybody you want to follow up with. So a few next steps. First, uh, and I'll ask our uh, staff members to drop this in the chat. Uh, we all have legislative action hubs, uh, where if you want to stay connected to us, uh, want to sign up for those links, uh, it's a good way to stay in the loop about bills as they're moving, actions we are asking people to take. Uh, feel free to sign up for those. You'll also receive it in a follow-up email. Uh, second, we are going to put together, it may take us a little bit of time, so it won't come right away, uh, but we're going to put together an easy toolkit for y'all uh, that kind of summarizes a lot of the good information from our 101 trainings and our 201 trainings. And so that will also include the contact information of a lot of the speakers you heard today. Uh, so look out for that here in the next week or two. We'll make sure you have that. And then finally, if you will head to the last slide, Brian, uh, I just want to let y'all know, as you may have heard or as you may have participated in, uh, we held a protest and a rally in Raleigh on Tuesday to call attention to the cruelty of our courts in lockstep with a lawless legislature. And that was not the end of our work as a people's coalition. Uh, we will be continuing to build the pressure on lawmakers with a follow-up town hall in Raleigh on Tuesday, March 28th. And after that, we will be bringing this show on the road to your communities and your districts all across the state to prioritize those that are far from us, like in the West, to prioritize our rural hubs, and to prioritize young people. So we invite you, if you are in the area, to join us on March 28th for a People's Town Hall in Raleigh with legislative leadership. Uh, since you are in this training, you will get more information about that over email, uh, so never fear. Uh, but we would love to see you and do know that we will bring you, be bringing this show to you. And so if you are in your community, you are interested in having a town hall, inviting your state or local leadership, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, and give us a ring. And with that, I'm seeing a lot of good chatter in the chat. That is the end of our training today, friends. If you're trying to save contact information, I'll give you a few more minutes to do that. Uh, and otherwise, look for a follow-up email from us about more next steps. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, and I'm really excited to keep building with y'all and building community with y'all in the weeks and months and years to come in this long fight. Uh, so have a good rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon. Let me make sure I save this chat. There's so much good stuff. Look at all that. Uh, feel free to take your time as you are leaving. Uh, I'll make sure to save this chat, save contact information. Go eat something nice. I'm sure it's a beautiful day outside. It's maybe a little chilly. Go touch some grass. Thing. Since we, we might not be able to get everything out, the um, thread, is it possible to, if you get all the contact information, can you do an email blast to us? I can absolutely do that, Ms. McCarthy. Thank you. <laughs> Y'all be blessed. And Jamie, we are coming to Dare County. I've already, you, you made the invitation. We're making it happen. Can't wait to come see you. Uh, Sarah, Town Hall in Caswell sounds like a beautiful idea to me. Please email, uh, please email us uh, either in the follow-up email or connect with us. We'll make it happen. All right. All righty, y'all. I'm going to save the chat. I'm going to end the recording and 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 kick y'all out. We love you. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So we'll talk to you soon.